changed the course of automotive history over a century ago. Or to learn of a test of machines and men in an event so incredible it has never been duplicated in a hundred years since. Who would have guessed that a quiet mechanic from Buffalo, New York would win a race most felt would never succeed even as far as Chicago, let alone Paris. At a time in the early automotive era when a motor car after a woman was considered the most fragile and precious thing on earth. <laughs> Jeff Ball brings to light the events of the 1908 and, uh, of the 1908 New York to Paris great automobile race. You'll experience the race just as Jeff heard the recollections of his great grandfather, George M. Schuster, driver and chief mechanic of the mini American Thomas Flyer. It was an epic international event matching the best in automotive technology and the, of the world's superpowers Germany, France, Italy, and the United States. All of the time, there were at that time, there were few roads, and most of the world's population had never seen a motor car, or even an American. Let's go back to 1908. Young man, young man, please excuse me, pardon me, pardon me. Please, thank you, thank you very much. Please, sir, please, sir, I, I have something very important to say to you. It was just as important back when I said it 100 years ago, when I was the 26th President of the United States. <laughs> you see, my name is Theodore Roosevelt. I am now... <laughs> bully, bully, bully. I am now 158 years old. Don't I look fit? My Rough Riders are outside, bully. What I have to say, what I said 100 years ago, is just as pertinent today. But since I'm 158 years old, my eyes are as clear as a Sagamore Hill morning, but my mind is not. Bully. I understand the current guy reads from one of those teleoprompters. Bully. <laughs> this is very important, and it's just as important today as it was then. It's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles, or where the doer of deeds could have done, more, done them more better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes short again and again. Because there is no error without shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, who knows great enthusiasms, the great devotions, who spends himself in a worthy cause, who at the best knows in the end triumph of high achievement, who at worst, if he fails, at least fails while daring greatly, so that his place shall never be with those cold and timid souls who neither know victory nor defeat. Fully. Important words. I heard that my good friend George Schuster's great-grandson was here. My goodness, he, young man, young man, come here. You are the splitting image of your great-grandfather. Mr. President, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Boy. <laughs> now, it's, it's not every day you get introduced by the President of the United States, so I feel very honored by that. Welcome. I uh, was so grateful when I got the invitation to join you for your jubilee celebration of the AACA. The AACA has done so much to preserve 
automotive history, and 75 years is a milestone. What we're going to talk about tonight is another milestone in automotive history, and it was the New York to Paris race. Now, some of you, how many of you saw the great race with Tony Curtis, Natalie Wood, Jack Lemon, Peter Falk, the big pie fight, all of that? Well, forget all of that. <laughs> Growing up, I was so fortunate. Uh, great Gramp lived to the age of 99 years old. He was still shoveling snow in Buffalo, just south of Buffalo, New York, at the age of 97. He still had and drove, a, with a New York State driver's license, cars at the age of 95. Now, of course, by the time of his passing, I had grown through childhood and was actually in my early 20s. And early on, I remember it was like, as a youngster, oh, great gramps telling another story, you know, and we all wanted to go out and play. But about the age of 14, I had to do a paper for school. And I remember, like any 14-year-old, just racking my brain, trying to think, what in the world am I going to write about? And it dawned on me, I could write about the New York to Paris race. So my whole attitude about what I was hearing from great gramp changed at that point. We lived in the same small village south of Buffalo, New York, and I can remember riding my bicycle. We lived on one side of the village, and Great Gramp lived up on East Hill on the other side, and I would ride my bicycle up, especially in the summer at, uh, when school was out, and uh, we would sit on his front porch swing. And I, looking back, I thought, boy, what a great Norman Rockwell painting this would be. The great-grandfather telling these, these fabulous tales, which were all true, I later found out, uh, to his great-grandson. It was certainly better than anything I was seeing on TV at the time, Gunsmoke and Perry Mason. This, this way outclassed that. And uh, as I grew older and, and realized more of this, it became even more important to me. And like, like any family gathering, uh, particularly during the holidays, the families would gather together and the adults would be out in the kitchen and in the dining room and preparing the meal. And great Gramp would have the great grandchildren gathered in the front living room telling us some of these fabulous stories. It was February the 11th, 1908. I was in Providence, Rhode Island, the chief mechanic for the E.R. Thomas Motor Company in Buffalo, New York. It was my job as chief mechanic to accompany the vehicles to the dealers, telling them about the new features and what the, uh, the new model year brought to them. And I wasn't particularly impressed with the, with the 08 Thomas Flyer, but uh, it was my job to do the best I could, and uh, part of my mission was to demonstrate the vehicle. Well, after a particularly difficult day with the dealer, I went back to the hotel and there was a telephone call waiting for me. It was from the plant superintendent in Buffalo, and he said, George, ER has decided to enter an automobile in the New York to Paris race. Now, I had heard about this race before, but at that point, no American manufacturer had entered a car in the competition. Now, you have to remember, in 1908, no automobile had ever crossed the United States in the wintertime, much less cross from New York to Paris. I remember thinking, uh, briefly about the challenge that it would be, and 
I told the superintendent that uh, I had a suitcase full of dirty laundry and I thought I was coming down with a cold. But yes, I would be in New York City the next morning to begin the race around the world. I remember soon after that calling my wife back in Buffalo and she was there with my young son, George Jr., who was four years old at the time. And I said, Rose, uh, I'm not going to be home this weekend as I had planned. And she said, oh. <laughs> and I said, no. And she said, where are you going? And I said, around the world, <laughs> to Paris. And I'll never forget her response. She simply said, George, I'll pray for you. <laughs> now, I don't know how many wives would be that understanding today, but I packed up my suitcase, got on the night train for New York. I remember I was in a Pullman and fell fast asleep, and the next thing I knew, I awoke in New York City. The premise for the race was really very simple. The reason that we started February the 12th, Lincoln's birthday, in the dead of winter in New York State, was so that we could literally drive from New York to Paris. Now there's that little obstruction in the middle called the Pacific Ocean. Well, the simple fact of the matter was we were going to use the frozen Bering Strait as an ice bridge to drive over the Pacific Ocean. No problem. We can do this. Well, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police heard about our plan, and they said, if you try driving, and remember, this was decades before the Alcan Highway was even thought of. They said, if you try driving an automobile in the middle of the winter through Canada, you will all die. So they prohibited us from doing that. So the race planners quickly got the maps out and drew some lines across it, taking us from New York to San Francisco. From there, we were to load on to a steamer up to Seattle, then another steamer taking us to Valdez, Alaska, where we would again begin our drive to Paris. Now, the Asia and European part of the uh, trip was equally interesting. The red line represented the planned route which we would have taken had we gone through Alaska. You'll see where we ran into a problem or two once we got to uh, Valdez. The black line actually represents the route that we finally took. 22,000 miles. This was the scene in New York City the morning of February 12th, 1908. There were 250,000 people in Times Square. This was the equivalent of going to the moon. This was so beyond belief. Ransom Olds had flatly turned down the notion of entering the race. Henry Ford had flatly turned down the notion. And even E.R. Thomas said, none of the cars will get past Chicago. Remember, snow plows hadn't even been invented yet. But we had a president by the name of Theodore Roosevelt. And once Teddy heard that there were going to be Frenchmen, Italians, and Germans driving horseless carriages across the United States, what do you think he said? There will be an American competitor. So I guess the polite way to say it is that uh, Teddy encouraged ER to make an entry in the race. Well, as a result, there was no preparation for us, as the other competitors had had weeks and months to prepare. Our other competitors were an interesting lot. This was the first of three French competitors, the motor block. And the motor block uh, the driver of the motoplac was a chap by the name of Goddard. And Goddard had actually participated in the race that sparked the New York to Paris race, the 1907 Peking to Paris event. Goddard was actually a driver in that race. 
Now, Goddard was, I guess you would say, a bit of a scoundrel. He had the habit of, of acquiring supplies and parts along that route from Peking, uh, China, to Paris and never paying for them. So the French police were at the finish line and promptly threw him into prison. Well, he must have had a good lawyer because he got out in time to prepare a car to come to New York. Now, the Peking to Paris race was sponsored by a Parisian newspaper, the Le Matin. And what the Le Matin discovered was that this was incredible because it was, I guess what you would say, like reality TV is today. Everybody would buy a newspaper in the morning to see how their favorite team was doing. They had sold so many newspapers that they said, now in 1908, we're going to have to do something even grander. So they teamed up with another newspaper, the New York Times, who co-sponsored the race. Well, of course, this brought out an international field of competitors. This was the second of the French entries, the Césarine Nadine. Now, this was a single-cylinder, 15-horsepower motor car. Most of your lawnmowers have more power than this does today. <laughs> I took one look at it and I didn't give it much chance of, uh, of winning. Now you can see a, an interesting thing. Along the side of the Cesarin is a hand-lettered sign for this upstart tire company called Michelin Tires. I guess that this would be the first example of what they would say in NASCAR was product placement on the side of the uh, automobile. This was the third and probably the most serious of the French competitors. This was the Dédion Bouton, actually a very well-built French motor car. And heading up that car was a chap you'll see all dressed in white. And his name was Balsier saint Chaffrey. And uh, I guess the thing that I could say about Balsier was he was a bit of a pompous Frenchman. He considered himself the Napoleon of the automobile. And uh, uh, I guess arrogance and uh, a bit of an attitude, but um, proved to be a, a very viable competitor. Now also in that team, which were all French with the exception of one, was Captain Hansen. Now Captain Hansen was not French. He was a Norwegian explorer. He was actually a ship captain. And Jules Verne would have loved Hansen. Captain Hansen had actually fashioned a mast and a sail, which would rise out of the middle of the Dadion. And when they got to Siberia, he would put two skis on the front wheels. And he would use the prevailing Siberian winds to literally blow the Dadion to Paris. <laughs> Another idea that didn't work as well as it sounded. These were our most formidable competitors. This was the 6,000 pound German Protoss. Now the Protoss was actually constructed by 800 Germans in a period of less than four weeks. This was, was a national effort. Kaiser Wilhelm actually owned eight motor cars himself. And a lot of people theorize that the Kaiser's interest in the Protos went far beyond an automobile race. You have to remember this was soon before World War I. And many feel that part of the motivation of the Protos entry was to prove the automobile as a war machine. The car was staffed by German military. The head of the car was Lieutenant Hans Kuppen, and Lieutenant Kuppen was on leave from the German general staff in Berlin. And Lieutenant Kuppen's orders were very specific. To win this race for the fatherland, and I'm sure there was probably a little pause, don't bother coming home if you don't. Ah, uh, the Italian lads. <laughs> The chaps on this car were in their late teens, early 20s, and all of the competitors jokingly referred to it as the children's car. <laughs> and young Antonio Scarfaglio 
went with the car, and he was the son of a very wealthy Napoles newspaper man. And young Antonio went to his father and he said, Father, I wish to become part of the Italian team for the glory of Italy to win this motor car race because the Italians had won the Peking to Paris race the year before and to carry on this grand tradition of winning epic races. And his father said, absolutely not. It's far too dangerous. So the boy countered with, well, father, if you won't let me do that, I will get a motorboat and I will race it across the Atlantic Ocean. Well, his father, weighing the risk of the two ventures, said, okay, you can go with the Italian team. Now, through the course of the race, there were a few delays with the Italian car. We didn't know, really, where it was. And we later began to speculate that the young Italian lads and the young American women might have had something to do with some of those unexplained delays. <laughs> this was the Thomas Flyer. It was a 1907 model. Actually, I was happy when I saw this. I didn't know which car we were going to have. They pulled this off of the factory lot, shipped it by rail to New York, and in a matter of days, that was our entry. Now this was a standard Model 35, 60 horsepower. On a good road, we could do 60 miles per hour. The only modifications that were made for this were to add to the creature comforts. You can see, we had no roof. We had no windshield. We didn't even have doors on the car. And we were going to travel in the middle of the winter to Paris. So the factory had fashioned some iron hoops for us. And over those iron hoops, they would stretch canvas. Well, that made us look like a Conestoga wagon going down the road. <laughs> now, the problem with that was that the snow and the ice and the sleet and the rain would all funnel in underneath that canvas right on top of us. So we quickly got rid of the iron hoops. The only other modification that was made were the planks. You see the planks extending from the front fenders to the rear. Those planks were our bridges. There were no bridges. Once you got outside of the cities, there were no paved roads. So when we would come to a ditch or something that we had to cross, we would lay the planks out ahead of us, drive across, go back, retrieve the planks, put them back on the car until we came to the next ditch. This was the starting line. This photograph was actually taken from the 12th floor of the New York Times building. And you'll see the cars all quite properly lined up, headed north in the direction of Albany. I remember that afternoon, it was, it was cold, it was in the 20s, but there was no snow in Times Square. The race was to begin at 11 o'clock that morning. And the mayor of New York City was the one who was to fire the pistol, a gold-plated pistol, to begin the race. The crowd was so thick that even with a police escort, the mayor of New York could not get to the starting line. So the president of the Auto Club of America, the predecessor of today's AAA, at 11.10 that morning raised that gold-plated pistol into the air and began the race around the world. Now you can see this very familiar aspect Many of you saw it last New Year's Eve on TV of the New York Times building. Of course, Times Square looks a bit different today. But if you look closely, you'll see the competitors all lined up single file, proceeding north in the direction of Albany. I remember traveling through the streets of New York City. And I will never forget the entire distance to the city limit of New York City through the boroughs of New York were lined with people on each side of the 12 people deep. People were hanging out of the windows. They were, had flags. They were waving it. And we could always tell because we were the host country, our vehicle was last in line. And we knew when we were going through an Italian neighborhood because we would hear roars and cheers. And we knew when we were going through French and German because we would hear the same. But in 1908, things were quite different. New York City was a city of immigrants. But when those immigrants saw the stars and stripes of the Thomas Flyer coming through the streets of New York, there was a thunderous roar 
that extended from Times Square to the northern limit of New York City, cheering on the Stars and Stripes and the Thomas Flyer. Now, as we got to the northern edge of New York, it began to snow. First lightly, but then a bit more. When we got to the city limits, things changed. <laughs> Remember, snow plows hadn't been invented. Antifreeze hadn't been invented. Winter driving was something that was not common. You put your automobile away in a shed or a barn, and you brought it out in the spring. You didn't drive in the wintertime. This is the reason why. Our progress to Albany through Poughkeepsie was, was arduous. We literally had to hand shovel much of the way. As a matter of fact, the Cesar in Nadin, the single cylinder French entry, got to Poughkeepsie, ran into a snowbank, and that was the end of the race for that French entry. We labored on. We got to the Erie Barge Canal in Albany, and that had a towpath. They were still taking barges on the Erie Canal with mules back and forth between Albany and Buffalo. Well, the towpath that the mules used was raised above the surrounding countryside so the snow would blow off of it. And we found some clear going for a few miles doing that, but we got to Syracuse and I remember that night when we got up the next morning, we found the towpath covered with two inches of ice from a sleet storm. Well, of course, the crown and the towpath would have taken us down into the frozen waters of the Erie Barge Canal. So from that point on, we literally took to the fields. We crossed cabbage patches, cornfields, orchards, farmers' backyards, farmers' front yards. I began the race as the mechanic, and the plan was simple. I would be the mechanic to Cheyenne, Wyoming, and a young chap by the name of Monty Roberts was going to be the driver to Wyoming. He had to leave and come back to the East Coast for the 1908 Glidden Tour, which he had already committed to. So my job as mechanic was to get out in front and walk in front of the Thomas Flyer with a long stick and I would poke it down through the snow to see how deep the snow was to find the best possible route. There were times when we had to literally replace the horsepower with real horsepower. We would hook teams of horses, sometimes eight to twelve horses at a time, and literally drag the Thomas Flyer through the predicaments we found ourselves in. There were many times that particularly in one area that we got to, this was the worst recorded snow blizzard since records were, began to be kept, and we measured our progress in feet per hour. We finally made it to Buffalo, our hometown. We were in the lead. This is Delaware Avenue, which is now Route 5 on the outskirts of Buffalo. And as was often the custom, the local motorist would gather and wait at the city limits for us, and as we would come through, they would follow us into the heart of the city. I remember that night we were to have a grand banquet at the Iroquois Hotel down in Lafayette Square in Buffalo. We, were the, we arrived first, the French arrived second. We were preparing to go to the banquet, and I got from the hotel clerk a message and it was a message from the Italian team. I opened it up, and it simply said, we will see you in San Francisco. They weren't going to stop for the banquet. Well, we hastily canceled the banquet plans and gave chase to the Italian lads, not to let them beat us any further. Well, things got worse. We came to a place called Corona, Ohio. And I remember um, pulling in for the night. It was just about dark. And uh, we pulled in, and, and my job as the mechanic, while the others went in to begin uh, dinner, was to, of course, drain the radiator block. We had to drain it so it wouldn't freeze at night. By the time I got into the restaurant, which was in the middle of the hotel, there was a large potbelly stove used to heat the restaurant. 
And I remember there were a number of patrons in the restaurant, and Monty, as he often liked to do, began telling stories. And he was leaning back in his chair, and as he did so, he nudged the potbelly stove in the middle of the restaurant, breaking the stovepipe that went up through the middle of the ceiling, sending billows of soot and smoke into the restaurant. I remember the proprietor, a stout Irish woman, came out screaming at the top of her lungs about what we had done to her beautiful restaurant. Well, needless to say, she threw us out into the blizzard. Well, Monty said, no problem. We can get to Kendallville, just eight miles away. We'll drive there, and we'll spend the night in Kendallville. Well, of course, that meant I had to refill the radiator again and restart the car. We had gone no more than two or three miles. And suddenly, there was snow over the hood of the Thomas Flyer. We had run into a snowdrift, and in those days, we didn't have radio or, or communications. We had no idea what the weather was ahead of us. But I remember seeing a light in the distance on a farmhouse, and I went up to the, the farmer door, and I knocked, and he came out. I explained to him that, I'm George Schuster. I'm with the American Thomas Flyer. And I said, we need your help desperately. We need you to hitch up your team and help tow us through this snowdrift. Well, he said, uh, give me a moment. As a matter of fact, there's coffee and donuts. Help yourself. So he dressed, hitched up his team, came in, and uh, brought the team out into this raging blizzard. We didn't realize, but this snowdrift ran 10 to 12 feet deep for three miles. It took us 12 hours that night to get through to the other side of that drift, shoveling, dragging, and towing the flyer. We finally got to Kendallville the next morning. We slept for a couple of hours, and once again, we were on our way. This was our crew. In the back seat, you'll see T. Walter Williams. T. Walter Williams was a reporter with the New York Times, quite famous, actually. He had accompanied President Teddy Roosevelt on his African safaris and had taken photographs from all over the world and was a very well-respected New York Times reporter. And his, his job was simple. He was to take five photographs per day and he was to send a story back to the New York Times. That's actually one of the reasons that the New York to Paris auto race was one of the very best documented events in the early 1900s because there was an, what you call today an embedded reporter riding in the back seat of the Thomas Flyer. Now next to him, you'll see a chap by the name of George Miller sitting on the rear fender. We got to, to Buffalo, our home office, and I went up to ER's office and I said, uh, Mr. Thomas, there's only Monty and myself as company people on the Flyer. If one of us got sick or something happened and when Monty has to leave in Cheyenne, I need another person. And he said, take your pick of the factory. So I remember my first pick was a very good mechanic at the factory who I knew well, whose name was also Miller. He was very excited. And he said, well, I must go home and pack. He came back not more than an hour later with tears in his eyes. And I said, what's the problem? And he said, my wife, she won't let me go. <laughs> well, I then, met, I then made my pick of George Miller. And George is the chap that you see sitting there. Now, I knew George was not married, so the wife wouldn't be the problem. But he said, well, I will have to go home and ask my father. He went home, and he came back suitcase in hand and ready to go. I'm seated in the rider's seat. And next to me, behind the driver's wheel, is young Monty Roberts. Now, Monty was 25, and Monty was, I guess, probably what you would think of as being like a Jeff Gordon today. Very charismatic, a bit of a ladies' man, really quite a famous driver, and uh, had a very good reputation as a driver. So that was the four of us, and uh, off we were to Paris. Well, we got to Chicago, the snow stopped, 
But that's when the mud started. We jokingly referred to the mud as gumbo. It was a sandy clay mixture. And the problem with it is that the mud would throw up onto the frame of the Thomas Flyer, adding hundreds of pounds of weight to an already over, overladen car. Now, the first uh, time we encountered this mud, by that afternoon and evening when we were ready to stop, we, I knew we had to get that mud off the car because it was freezing at night. And if that mud froze to the automobile, the next morning we would simply add hundreds of more pounds of weight to the car. So I remember in the village that we came to, there was a fire station. And I went over to the fire station, I found the fire chief and I said, Chief, we need your firemen out here right away. You need to ring the bell. And he says, an emergency? And I said, it sure is. <laughs> well, in those days, the firemen had pump trucks. And they would hand pump. They would put four men on each side to build pressure on the hose. So I said, we need you to bring your pumper truck. And they started pumping water, squirting the mud off of the Thomas Flyer. We didn't realize it, but we had invented the first car wash. <laughs> well, that worked so well that we planned our stops after that to be sure, while we were in this mud, to always get to a village that had a fire station large enough to have a pumper truck. This gives you a little bit of an idea of how we were equipped. You'll see uh, my toolbox down there, and you'll see it was pretty sparse. And we did add a reserve fuel tank to give us a little bit more fuel capacity. And if you look very closely, you'll see a position that I found myself in through much of the way around the world. <laughs> you see, the Thomas Flyer was chain drive. And the problem with chain drive was every time we took the impact of a rut or a snow drift or whatever we were into, it would stretch the chain. So I had to constantly adjust to keep proper tension on the drive chain so that it wouldn't spin off the sprocket. We got to Cheyenne, and it was there that Monty left. And the other part, and I was sad to see Monty go. The other part of the problem is that what roads and trails there were stopped at Cheyenne. There was only one thing that went west from Cheyenne. That was the Union Pacific Railroad. Now, the rules were very clear. We would have been disqualified if we rode on the steel rails. But nothing said we couldn't straddle the rails and use the rail bed. So I went to the station master at Cheyenne and I said, sir, we need, we need the use of your railroad. And I explained to him that we wanted to drive along the rails. And he said, well, I don't see any problem in that. And what we shall do is we shall make you a locomotive of the Union Pacific Railroad. This is the actual original, original train order making us engine number 274 of the Union Pacific. Now I said, of course, as a Union Pacific train, you're going to need a conductor. So I remember the conductor coming up to me with his conductor's hat on and his clipboard and he had his red lantern with him. And we made the introductions to me. He said, Mr. Schuster, how long will it take to get to the next siding? And he gave me the distance and I told him about when I thought we could make it. And he said, well, that will do. Because he said, the one thing that we have to be mindful of is that the New York to San Francisco express train takes this same rail. And the express train does not stop for anything. So I said, well, that should be all right. Well, there was a bit of a problem because you see, in those days, there was no stone be between the ties. So we were riding on our balloon tires, taking tremendous jolts from tie to tie to tie. We had gone no more than a mile and bang! The right front tire blew. Now in those days, you didn't carry a fully mounted spare tire. So it meant jacking up the car, removing the full assembly, breaking the tire, the lock ring apart, taking the tube off and the tire off, putting on a spare tube and tire, 
reassembling it, reassembling the locker and then pumping the tire up with a bicycle hand pump, reinstalling it back on the car. Now I was pretty good putting tires back, but it took me 45 minutes. So naturally, the conductor at this time was looking at his schedule and was becoming a bit concerned. We got back underway again and we had gone no more than a half mile and bang! The right rear tire blew. The last thing I remember was the conductor running frantically in an easterly direction, waving his light back and forth, trying to stop that oncoming express train locomotive from New York. Well, fortunately, he stopped it. Now, of course, the engineer and the fireman were quite impatient about what in the world was they had a schedule to keep. But when they passed us, and this is actually a famous painting by Peter Halk, the artist Peter, and showing that engineer and that fireman, and once they saw it was the Thomas Flyer that was causing the delay, no problem. They sounded the whistle and, and waved to us encouragement. And I remember the ladies in the back was the dining car. And I remember the ladies were in the, along the windows waving their handkerchiefs in the window for encouragement. Once again, we were on our way to Paris. The railroad grades were treacherous. Here we slid off the grade because there were only inches that we had and the slightest turn of the car meant we would slide down the embankment. Fortunately, we were stopped here, but some of these embankments would go down 60 and 70 feet. If we slid off there, the car would have catapulted down and that would have been the end of the race for us. We literally had to hand winch the Thomas Flyer back onto the roadbed again to continue our journey. Crossing the rails was as bad as riding the rails. There were no automotive crossings like you have today, railroad grades. We would have to take timbers and build our own crossings every time we wanted to cross the rail line. A long and arduous process. Finally, we got to the Rocky Mountains. Now looking at the Rocky Mountains up there, San Francisco is on the other side of those mountains. But, as you can see, there was still snow up there. And the top of that mountain that you're looking at has a place, the only pass through, called Donner Pass. Now everybody knows what happens in Donner Pass when it snows. And we weren't about to go, go up there and try and find out if it was true or not. So we turned south and took a route down through Nevada, and we were going to approach San Francisco from the south, heading down in the direction of Death Valley and coming through Southern California back up to San Francisco. Well, we had been warned of a place uh, called Twin Springs Ranch. And again, there were no bridges for an automobile. They had simply, in this case for uh, this crossing, had put in boulders and they would take horse-drawn wagons and of course the horses would cross using this. Things worked pretty well until we tried to come out the other side. And when we came out the other bank, I remember hearing a crunch, a grind, and a bang, and the motor racing, but the wheels weren't turning. We had stripped the teeth out of our pinion gear. Now, this presented a bit of a problem. If it would have been modern days, like today, we could have had a pinion gear FedExed in overnight. <laughs> FedEx wasn't there in 1908. So there was only one option for me. I knew that we had sold a Thomas to a doctor in a place called Tonopah, 70 miles south of Twin Springs. That was the nearest part. So, I started walking. I walked until I came to a ranch house, and I went up to the door and, and I asked the rancher, I said, Sir, I'm George Schuster with the American Thomas Flyer, and we're headed to Paris, but I'm in desperate need of a horse. I'd like to borrow one. And he said, Well, I'm sorry, Mr. Schuster, but I don't have any horses to lend, but I do have a horse I can sell you. I said, how much? He said, $20. I had no choice. I gave him the $20.
He took me around back to the corral and back, and I remember it was a, a sway back gray in their mare. I took one look at it and shook my head, but it was certainly better than walking to Tonopah. So I got on the horse and I, and I looked down at the rancher and I said, uh, how will I know which trail to take to Tonopah? And he said, oh, don't worry, the horse knows. <laughs> so we started plodding along. It was about two o'clock in the morning, pitch black, and I, we came to an adobe farmhouse and there was a light on in the farmhouse and I went up to the door and I knocked on the door and from behind the door I heard a woman's voice say, who is it? So I dutifully explained, I'm George Schuster with the American Thomas Flyer, I'm here, I'd like to get some, some food and water for my horse and I'm wondering if there's a place to sleep. She said, if you come through that door I'll shoot you. I said, I'm not coming through the door, don't worry. She said, you can take yourself and your horse out back. There's a corral out back and there's a shed and a stable. You can sleep there in the straw. So I took the horse around back, took the bars back across the corral and fell immediately to sleep. I was exhausted. It was probably about an hour later. I remember hearing the corral bars move. I reached back for my Colt revolver. I carried a sidearm with me. I said, who is it? They said, we're from Tonopah. We're looking for the American Thomas Flyer. It's overdue. We were expecting it hours ago. I said, well, I'm who you're looking for. I'm George Schuster. We're broke down up at Twin Springs. Can you help me? He said, yes, come on in, hop in. He had a simplex. We took the simplex back to Tonopah. We got there just about dawn. I went up to the doctor's door and knocked. The doctor came to the, to the door in his nightshirt, and I explained to him what my need was and that I really needed the pinion gear out of his Thomas Flyer. I said that the, the factory will definitely replace it. I have no idea how long it will take them to get you the new part, but I said, in order to continue, I need that gear. He said, Mr. Schuster, take whatever you need off the car. I removed the pinion gear, got back in the simplex, we drove back to Twin Springs. By the time I got back to Twin Springs, the problem was this crick bed was quicksand. The car had literally started to sink. So while I was gone, they had jacked the car back up, putting boulders under the wheels to hold the flyer from sinking out of sight in the quicksand. If you look real closely, you'll see my feet again. I had to tunnel out the quicksand underneath the flyer to get up, remove the old pinion gear, put the new pinion gear again, put the assembly back together, hopped in the flyer, and once again, we were on our way to Paris. Now we made it to San Francisco. We loaded onto a steamer in San Francisco and shipped off in the direction of Seattle, Washington, where we were to pick up a second ship. I got to Seattle and got to the pier and a doctor introduced himself and came up to me and he said, uh, Mr. Schuster, he said, I understand that you're going around the world. And I said, yes, yes we are. And he said, well now you realize that once you leave the United States, you're going to be hard pressed to find a doctor. And I said, well, I hadn't really given too much thought to that. You see, there weren't first aid kits for automobiles in those days. And he said, well, perhaps I can help. And he gave me this medical kit. This is a Park Davis medical kit, and the vials in that kit were filled with the wonder drugs of the day. Morphine and the remedies that were common use. And one of the remedies I remember was a remedy for dysentery, and he, and he also gave me, with me that hand-lettered book. And that was my instruction book. If I had a headache, I would turn to page 12 and I would find the remedy for the headache or whatever ailment I had and I would use that vial and it would tell me how much to take to cure. Well of course we had a tremendous problem on the entire trip with dysentery and we quickly ran out of the remedy for dysentery. But what I discovered works equally well was to take a pint of the local beverage. Now if we were in North America it would be whiskey, if we were in Asia it would be vodka, and I would drink the pint of whiskey, 
And then I would get out behind the Thomas Flyer and I would run after the car as it went forward until I broke a sweat. Then I would get back up in the car again, fall asleep, and when I woke up, the dysentery was cured. So if you run out of ammonium AD or Pepto-Bismol, all you have to do is a little bit of a run and a little bit of whiskey and you'll be fine. While we were in Seattle, just finishing our loading, another chap came up to us. And remember T. Walter Williams, the very famous New York Times reporter? He got to Seattle, Washington, or to uh, Chicago, and he said, you're all insane. You're crazy. And he hopped on a train back to New York City. Well, of course, this left us without a reporter in the back seat. He gave me his camera and his reporter's notebook, and I said to him, well, what do you want me to do with this? And he said, well, you file the stories for the New York Times. Well, fortunately, the, news, the local newspapers along the way picked up the story, and they provided the news coverage. Until we got to Seattle, the New York Times then sent a new, much younger, more durable reporter by the name of George McAdam. Now, George, I remember seeing him come down the pier, and he had in one hand his suitcase, and in the other hand, he had a crate of birds. Now, I looked at George, and I said, uh, McAdam, I said, what, what is the crate of birds for? And he said, oh, those, those are carrier pigeons. Now, in 1908, the ship had no way of communicating the daily story back to the New York, t to shore. So he couldn't get his dispatch back to the next morning's New York Times front page. So what McAdam would do is he would tie the story to the leg of the carrier pigeon. The carrier pigeon would fly from the ship back to Seattle's telegrapher's office. The telegrapher would take the story off the lake, key it back to New York City. The next morning it was on the front page of the New York Times. In 1908, that was a high-tech solution to communications. <laughs> this was actually the city of Valdez, well, today it's a city, then it was a village, Valdez, Alaska, preparing for us. There were no gas stations. There were no service or repair facilities. So what they had on these horse-drawn sleighs were gasoline. And they would take these along the trail, dropping them every so many miles, where we would pick up and we would refuel. The Thomas Flyer, was the first automobile ever in the Alaskan Territory. These folks had never seen a car before. We arrived on the pier, and I remember asking the ship captain coming up, I said, what is it like in Alaska? And he said, well, I never get much past the ship's pier, so I really can't tell you. But I said, the man who can really tell you is a fellow by the name of Dan Kennedy, who was actually the station master for the Wells Fargo stage line between Fairbanks and, or between Fairbanks and Valdez, Alaska. And he said, if anybody knows the trail, it's Dan Kennedy. Well, we got to the pier, and I remember the entire population of Valdez, Alaska came down to the pier to greet us. Now, as you notice, they had their local band there. Well, the band hadn't played since the prior 4th of July. So they were in desperate need of practice, but we accepted quite graciously their serenade when we got on the pier. And I, I said to Mr. Kennedy, I said, I've been told that you can tell me what the trail is like. You see, the race planners had never been to Alaska in the wintertime. And they said, don't worry. There's a crust that forms on top of the snow, and that crust is more than sufficient to support an automobile. Well, the person who made that analysis had never driven an automobile, we later found out. So Dan said, well, Mr. Schuster, I've never seen an auto before. I have no idea what it can do, but I said, I think that there's something that you need to see. So I agreed. He took me into downtown Valdez. Now, you see the mountains in the background? <laughs> we had to go through those. I said, well, it looks okay, but I think I need to see more. He said, all right, I've got a horse-drawn sleigh here. I'll take you on the trail. Well, 
we got just outside of town, you can see what happened to the horse-drawn sleigh. The snow couldn't support even the sleigh, much less a 5,000-pound Thomas Flyer. I said, well, I, I really, before I make a decision, I need to see a bit more. And he said, well, all right, I'll have him bring out a dog sled for us, and we'll go to Thompson's Pass by dog sled. The sled came, and we proceeded on to Thompson Pass. This is the only pass through the mountain range. And Dan Kennedy pointed out to me, he said, Schuster, there's no way you can get fit the Thomas Flyer through there. It's not wide enough. And I said, that's no problem. We'll simply get dynamite and we'll blast it out wide enough to pass through. And he said, but George, after that there is 40 miles of forest and the trail is only wide enough for a horse and a small wagon. I said, well, that's no problem. We'll simply hire Eskimos and we'll cut that trail wide enough for the Thomas Flyer. And he said, but George, after that is the Bering Strait. And the Bering Strait doesn't freeze like a pond. It freezes into pack ice. It's impossible to drive through. Well, I will admit, he had me there. I thought for a moment, I looked down at the dog sled, and I said, Dan, how much will a dog sled carry? And he said, well, a good dog sled will carry about 600 pounds. That's it. I will take the Thomas Flyer apart into pieces which weigh no more than 600 pounds. We will dog sled the Thomas Flyer across the Bering Strait. When I get to the frozen tundra of Siberia, I will reassemble the automobile and we will drive on to Paris. I telegraphed my plan back to the race committee in New York City and I said, we can do this, but it will cost $10,000. Now remember, this is $10,908 to get just from Valdez to Fairbanks. I have no idea what it will cost beyond that. And of course, the race committee did some quick math knowing that they would have to do the same for all the rest of the committers, uh, competitors, and they simply said, we must stop here, come back to uh, Seattle, and we will ship by ocean liner across to Japan. Well, we loaded the flyer back into the hold in, in uh, Seattle, and as you can see, we prepared it before we went down. We took the fenders. The factory had act actually replaced the fenders, which were the metal fenders, which were on the flyer, with leather fenders. I was desperate to cut weight off the Thomas flyer. We were way too heavy. So they replaced it with leather, which really worked quite well. We took the leather fenders and we put it under that tarp on the back of the flyer. About halfway across the Pacific, I went down in the hold of the ship to see how the car was traveling. I lifted up the tarp. All of my leather fenders were gone. I went up to the ship captain and I said, Captain, I went down to inspect the flyer and my leather fenders are gone. And he just looked at me shaking his head and he said, I thought something strange was happening because all of the Chinese crew on his ship had new leather soles on their sandals. <laughs> they made shoes out of the fenders of the Thomas flyer. But he said, don't worry, even though this was a steamship, he said, don't worry, I have on board, and they used to, at that point, carry a sailmaker. And he said, I will have the sailmaker make you canvas sail, or canvas fenders to replace the leather ones. Actually, they work quite well, and we made the rest of the journey to Paris on those canvas fenders. We got to Japan, and Japan was beautiful in the springtime. We had been through mud, snow, sleet, horrible horrible conditions, but it was springtime in Japan at this point. This was a, a local shaman priest, and actually he was there with his drum beating the evil spirits out of this motor car that was passing through his village. He was quite terrorized, as were the villagers, about this, this contraption that was invading his village. The problem in Japan was the roads were really quite good, but they were all designed for rickshaw or foot traffic. So every time you came to an intersection, the intersections were at right angles. There was no radius to the turn. So when we would come to where we had to make a change of a direction, we literally had to get out and lift the front axle of the flyer, move it a few inches, lift the rear axle, move it a few inches until we had turned the car 90 degrees and we were able to proceed in our new direction. 
We came to one village and I remember the homes, the roof, the eaves were so close that they touched in the center of the village and that was the only way through. So I actually paid a man to cut the front of his house off to make the road wide enough to get the flyer through, through the village. Very, very few horses in Japan. So when we needed assistance, we couldn't rely on horsepower, so we hired the villagers to come out. And here you can see men, women, and children we would hire to push or pull the flyer through whatever predicament we were in. You can see the railroads, of course, were much narrower gauge in Japan. So we didn't have the width that we had, and we were often forced to use uh, local uh, villagers to assist us. No bridges. The only bridges in Japan were rail bridges. So we would have to load the flyer onto a hand-pushed rail car, push it across the bridge, unload it on the other side to continue our journey. We would get into mud, and this is a kind of a tug of war between the villagers and the Thomas flyer. Here you can see they have actually put a long timber through the front axle. Villagers got on each side of the flyer, lifted the front axle off the ground. The other villagers were on the tow rope in front of us, dragging the rear axle through the mud that we were in. We came to uh, a mountain, and I'll never forget this mountain. The mountain went up, and there was a road up the mountain, but it was in switchbacks. It didn't just go straight up over the mountain. There was no way, even with the 60 horsepower that we had in the flyer, that I could possibly make it up that mountainside. So we hired 38 villagers to take the rope at the bottom of the mountain and literally drag us to the top of the mountain. Well, we got to the top of the mountain, looked down the back side with an equal slope, knowing that the brakes on the flyer would have never held. So we hired the villagers to come back the next morning, and if you look closely, you'll see the villagers on the back of the flyer lowering us down the back side of that mountain with human power. We finally got to the Sea of Japan, and you'll see there the ship that we would take from the coast of Japan to the coast of Asia. We would enter Asia at the port of Vladivostok. We crossed the Sea of Japan, and this was actually a map which I purchased in Vladivostok. This was our only road map that we had. And you can see it lacked quite a bit of detail. <laughs> the left side of the map is Asia, the right side of the map is Europe. There were no highway markers, there were no highways. I remember there were some curious little black and white pyramids that we followed for the portion of the route. And we asked, what are those, what are those markers for? Those markers had been placed by Marco Polo. We were on the Silk Route from China to Europe and portions of this trip. Well, we got to the port of, of Vladivostok, and I remember quite impatiently waiting there at the pier for me was Balsier St. Chaffrey. And Balsier said, Schuster, I must speak with you immediately. Now remember, he considered himself, he was the one all in white, who was the, commi the uh, commissioner of the automobile. And he saw himself in a, in a very important position. And he said to me, Schuster, he said, I'm, I am going to ride with the Thomas Flyer with you to Paris. And I said, well, why is that, sir? It seems that the Marquis d'Allion had gotten the car as far as Vladivostok. But his family started to look at the finances and what he had spent on this venture, and they were going to have the Marquis declared legally insane and take control of the Dedion Bouton factory for what he was spending on the race. So the choice was simple. Either he quit the race or he lose control of the factory to his family. Well, he sold the Dedion to a very wealthy Peking businessman, but of course this left St. Chaffrey without a right. Well, I said, sir, I'm sorry. All of the seats are taken. We have no room for you in the Thomas Flyer. He said, Schuster, either I go in the Thomas Flyer or no one goes. I own all of the gasoline in Vladivostok. <laughs> you see, the other competitors had gotten there before we had. We were the only car that went from Seattle up to Alaska. Now for that, we were given a 14-day 
advantage over all the rest of the competitors as a result of that. Also, the Germans had found to be cheating. They got to Idaho and they had a major breakdown. All of their parts were in Seattle. So being good German army officers, they decided that they were going to load the Protoss onto a rail car and because they, knew, they were military men, they knew how to camouflage it. So they camouflaged the Protoss so that people wouldn't know what it was. Well, of course, the train crew knew what it was and word quickly got out that the Germans were taking the rails. Initially, they got to Seattle and they were disqualified. But they appealed to the race committee and they said, all right, we're going to handicap you an additional 14 days, meaning that the Germans would have to beat us by 30 days, everybody else by 14. Well, with St. Joffrey in control of the gasoline, I didn't know what I would do. So I said to him, well, sir, come back tomorrow and I will give you my answer. I went into Vladivostok and Vladivostok had quite a German population and I was the son of a German immigrant born in the United States, but I could speak fluent German. I found a trading company called Kunst and Alberts. And I remember going into the, into the door of the uh, trading company and I found the clerk there and I said, sir, I wish to speak with your manager. And he said, well, sir, I'm sorry, but my manager is in a meeting right now. Perhaps I can help. And I said, well, I need petrol. I said, I, how much petrol can you sell me? And he said, well, I have about 35 gallons that I can sell. And he said, I will take it. We made the transaction, I paid him the money, I turned to leave, and just as I was going out the door, the manager came out of, the, out of his office. And I turned to thank him for the service of his clerk and for the gasoline. Now remember, the manager was a good German. He knew that the German Protoss was also in Vladivostok. And he said, there shall be no gasoline for the Americans. I turned to him, and I said, sir, I have with me a New York Times reporter. I am coming back here this afternoon to pick up the gasoline, the petrol, which I have paid for, and if it is not here waiting for me, he will cable a story back to New York telling the true nature of German sportsmanship. Ich komme für das Benzin zurück. Auf Wiedersehen, mein Herr. I turned and I walked out the door. I came back that afternoon. There was 165 gallons <laughs> of gas, of benzene waiting for me, which I gladly picked up, paid for, and returned to the hotel. Well, of course, St. Jaffrey was waiting for my answer. He said, well, Schuster, what's the answer? And I said, well, you shall have to find a different way because I have no need of your petrol. He went into a rage, furious at the fact that his plan had been foiled. So to soothe him a bit, I said, well, the Germans have room on their auto. Why don't you go with the Germans? I remember St. Chauff returning to me and see, he, saying, ah, a Frenchman on a German automobile, that would smell bad. <laughs> he took the train back to Paris. Well, the next morning we were ready to begin. Now the problem was, it had been raining for 27 of the past 30 days in Siberia. This meant that the frost had gone out of the permafrost. It was a sea of mud. We left the outskirts of Vladivostok to find this. The mud was so deep that horses would drown, sink out of sight in the mud. If you look very closely here, you'll see the mud line on this one particular horse where he had been up to his midsection, buried in the mud. We had to drive through this. I remember coming to a turn in the road, hearing the racing of an engine, and we knew that there was only one other engine that it could be in that part of Siberia. It had to be the Germans, which had left just hours before we did. We came around the bend to see this site. That's Lieutenant Kupin in his military uniform with the rear of the Protoss mired in mud so deep they couldn't move. Well, we found to the left of the car a bit of hard packed area where we were able to manage and maneuver by and we got ourselves in front of the, 
in front of the protos. And the temptation was there to turn back and to wave at the Germans and said, we will see you in Paris. But you know what? That wouldn't have been the right thing to do. So we stopped, we backed up, and we threw the Germans a tow line. We pulled the Germans out of that mud. Another painting by Peter Help, immortalizing that moment. The German Army Lieutenant Koopen was so overtaken by this show of sportsmanship that he had with him in his duffel bag a bottle of champagne. And he had been carrying that champagne from the start in New York City, and his plan was to open it up on their triumphant entry into Paris. This inspired and impressed the lieutenant so much that he went for that bottle of champagne and the two teams, the Germans and the Americans, toasted each other to camaraderie and sportsmanship out in the vastness of the Siberian wilderness. At that moment, the race was still a very intense, serious race, but we felt equally about what each team had been through to that point, and we realized the hardships we had all faced, and we had a tremendous respect for the Germans, and at that point, the only other team in the race were the young Italians. Their company had not yet released them from Vladivostok. Well, we continued on, and of course, we found ourselves soon after mired in the mud, but the Germans were nowhere in sight to help us. No bridges across rivers. We would hook teams of horses. I remember taking my slicker, wrapping the magneto up in it to try and keep it dry while we would cross. And you can see here the horseman taking the whip to the, his team to drag us through this particular river. Very, very common occurrence for us. We finally got to a place which was aptly named Camp Hard Luck. If you look very closely, you'll see rails behind the makeshift tent we sent up. Those are the rails of the Trans-Siberian Railroad. Well, at this point, we had attempted to cross over the rails of the Trans-Siberian and at that point, I heard an all too familiar sound of the crack, grinding, crunch, and sudden racing of the motor with nothing happening to the wheels. We had again stripped teeth out of the pinion gear. Now this time, there was no Thomas Flyer on the Asian continent for us to get parts from. So out of, I guess, what today you would call pure Yankee ingenuity, we took that pinion gear out and we had two teeth missing. We drilled and we drove, in two, we drove in metal screws. We then filed the heads of the metal screws in the shape of gear tooth. And we replaced those missing gear tooth with the heads of those screws. We put the pinion back into the Thomas Flyer and once again we were on our way to Paris. In Siberia, it was a lawless land. And there were good Manchurians that we encountered, and there were also something which we had been warned of called redbeards. And these redbeards were Manchurian marauders, ruthless killers. Their operation was very simple. You pay them or they kill you. The Russian army was sent to protect the Trans-Siberian Railroad from the redbeards. Now these were mounted horsemen, these were friendly Manchurian, but as I say, not all of them were that way. I remember coming to one intersection in the road. It was a cross in the road. And in the distance, I could see six horsemen, heavily armed. And we knew what their intentions were. These were the Redbeards that we'd been told in. Well, the problem was Paris was on the other side of them. So there was never any thought about stopping or waiting till they went away or go back to a safe haven. We had to continue. Now we had rifle and we had our sidearms, but we were no match for these ruthless killers. So I remember once we got close enough that they could hear us, in a moment of inspiration, we started acting like we were all lunatics, <laughs> laughing and pointing at each other and making gestures. And to the Redbeards, we must have looked like a spaceship because they had never seen an automobile before, much less one loaded with crazy Americans. 
going down through the middle of the road. And I remember it, they were mystified by what they saw and their horses simply parted on each side and we drove right through the center of the bandits. I remember I never looked back but I couldn't help it. Once safely passed, I loaded up the carburetor and let out an unmuffled backfire out of the engine. I looked back to find one of the horses rising up, sliding the bandit back into the mud, and we simply kept going toward Paris. Our navigation was primitive. There was no GPS to punch in where you wanted to go. This was a handmade sextant. I actually made the sextant, taught myself celestial navigation, and we used that to figure out where we were in the world. Now, in Cheyenne, Wyoming, we had taken on, when Monty left the car, we had taken on a new crew member. Remember Captain Hansen? Well, Captain Hansen had had it up to here with St. Trafford. And he went to E.R. Thomas saying, I could help the American team. I got a, telegraph, a telegram from E.R. saying, would you like to have Hansen on the team? Now, Hansen lived in Siberia. He could speak Russian. And he was strong. He was over six foot, one inch tall, which was very tall for people in those days. And I said, yes, I believe he would be a help. So he had joined the crew. Now, I remember at one point, we had been driving and were extremely fatigued. And we were all starting to get on each other's nerves. And we came to this fork in the road. And I remember looking and trying to decide. And my notion of it was we should take the right fork. Hansen said, no, 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 we shall, we shall take the left fork. And he really became quite insistent. And he felt that he, of course, living in Siberia, knew the way. I said, no, we need to take the right fork. The next thing I knew, Hansen was standing up with his pistol pointed at my head, saying, we shall take the left fork. Well, while I was considering my options at that point, I remember McAdam, the New York Times correspondent, standing up in the back seat, drawing his pistol on the head of Hansen, saying, no, we shall take the right fork. Well, fortunately, things cooled a bit, and we ended up taking the right fork, which turned out to be the proper choice of direction. And I remember later thinking, this was probably the first instance of what today you would call road rage. Well, we made it into uh, eastern Russia. This is actually in St. Petersburg. This was a monument raised to honor Russian czars, which had been rulers in Russia at that point when the monument was constructed for 1,000 years. So it, like all good tourists, we had to stop in front of the monument and quickly then make our way on into Berlin. July the 24th. 1908, we entered the streets of Berlin. Now, we didn't really know where the other teams were because we traded the lead back and forth with the Germans. We reasoned that the Italians were really quite far behind us. I remember coming into the city of Berlin and a very distinguished white-haired gentleman came up to me and he introduced himself. He was the father of Lieutenant Hans Kuppen, a German general. And he explained to us that that very day, July the 26th, 1908, he had entered, his son had entered the streets of Paris to claim victory for Germany in the New York to Paris race. Now, of course, we were surrounded by Germans. So I was not about to explain that his German team had had a 15, a 14-day handicap for cheating and taking his car by rail and everybody had been handicapped an additional 14 days, so his son would have to beat us by 28 days, not by four, as it turned out. Not wishing to argue the point and knowing better, we simply took our leave from Berlin and headed to Paris. I remember we got to the city of Paris. It was July the 30th in the afternoon. We could see the Eiffel Tower. And as was the custom in those days, all automobiles coming into the city of Paris had to stop and pay a tax on their gasoline in order to enter, which we did. We didn't have much gasoline left, and we had money to do it. 
So while we were paying the collector, a Parisian gendarme policeman slowly started to walk around the car. Well, he got to the front of the flyer and he looked at me, and he looked up at me and he looked down, and he looked up at me, and he raised his hand saying, no entree. I looked at him, I said, no entree, no. It seems that all automobiles entering the city of Paris had to have two operating headlights. Well, an unfortunate pigeon took flight a bit too late just outside Moscow and broke the glass in our left front headlight. Well, of course, they were carbide headlights, so they depended on the glass to operate, so it didn't function without the, without the uh, glass. And, of course, we had no replacement glass, and the carbide lights were only good for about 20 feet, so we did not make the repair. And it didn't become an issue until we got to Paris. I told the gendarme in my broken French that we had come some 22,000 miles from Times Square in New York City, traveling 169 days. We could see the finish line, but he would not let us enter? No. <laughs> well, fortunately, before I went into a rage, a Parisian bicyclist overheard the predicament, and he came up to me and he said, Monsieur, perhaps I can help. I have on my bicycle a headlight. You can take the bicycle from my headlight, put it on, and use it to make your second headlight. Well, I quickly got my tool bag, but I soon found that I couldn't get the lamp off the bicycle without damaging both, so we hoisted the lamp and the bicycle onto the hood of the Thomas Flyer. We crossed the finish line to win the New York to Paris race with a bicycle on the hood. Here's a picture of our entry into Paris, and of course the Parisians were thrilled by the fact that the Americans had won the race, not their, the Germans, and if you look very closely, you'll see Hansen in the crowd standing up at the back of the Thomas Flyer. Well, we quickly proceeded to the official finish of the race, uh, which was the office of the Le Matin, and then being exhausted, went to the hotel and quickly fell asleep. I think I slept for two days, never woke up. We then took by ship the flyer to New York City. We were greeted in New York City with a hero's welcome. The, the flyer was offloaded from the ship. They took us with a ticker tape parade down past Wall Street, and our destination was City Hall. The mayor of New York was going to welcome us back to New York, but he wasn't going to take the chance of getting, not being able to get through the crowds, so we were to go to him in this case. These are the steps of Buffalo City Hall where the mayor presented me with a key to the city of New York. After the ceremony, he leaned over to me and he said, Mr. Schuster, there's someone else who would like to meet you. And I said, well, who might that be? He said, the President of the United States. Teddy Roosevelt was at his summer White House in Sagamore Hill, which is in Oyster Bay, Long Island. So we left the steps of City Hall, got back into the flyer, never changing clothes, and headed to meet the president. I can remember the Secret Service agent got onto the uh, running board and he said to me, he said, Mr. Schuster, have you ever met the president? And I said, no, but I'm quite looking forward to it. We came up and it's a beautiful home um, overlooking Oyster Bay. And I remember Teddy was in the back in his knickers and he was playing tennis with the postmaster general and his young son, Kermit. And I remember from the tennis court, he was waving us saying, go in, go in, go in. We went into his trophy room. And it was a bit of an overwhelming experience. When we went in waiting for the president's arrival, he had all of the mounts of all of his African safaris. So we had lions and tigers and elephants staring down on us while we were sitting there quite patiently waiting for, for the president to arrive. I remember uh, Teddy came into the room and we all stood and uh, greeted him and uh, he congratulated us. And one of the first questions he asked me, but you have to remember who Teddy Roosevelt was and what Teddy was about. And one of the first questions he asked me was, Mr. Schuster, how were you armed? He was concerned about the weapons we were carrying. Now, if you were Teddy Roosevelt, that would be an important thing. So we explained that and then he invited us into his library for brandy and cigars. We talked a little bit there and. Then uh, 
I asked uh, Mr. President, would you like to come to see the Thomas Flyer? And he said, I most certainly would. He came out and Teddy got up into the flyer behind the wheel. He never actually drove it. But I remember him, him saying to me, one of the last things he said to me was he said, Schuster, I like people who do things, not the good man who stays at home. So we shook, took our leave, and off we were to Buffalo. Well, we had a hero's welcome in Buffalo, but things became quiet after that. Actually, in 1912, the E.R. Thomas Company, the most famous motor vehicle manufacturer in the world, went bankrupt. Because you see, in 1908, two things happened. First thing that happened was millions of people, not only in America, but around the world, realized that this four-wheel drive, horseless carriage could not only be used in the summertime, it could be used in the wintertime, and it couldn't be used not just locally, you could drive across the country, you could drive around the world. Now, at that point, millions of people wanted a horseless carriage. The problem was, a horseless carriage in those days were all fine motor cars, costing over $4,000 more than houses cost. So still, only the wealthy could afford it until a man by the name of Henry Ford in September of that year came out with the Model T. This was suddenly an automobile that was one-tenth the car, or the one-tenth the price of the fine cars, the Pierce Arrows and the Thomas Flyers of the day. So he had this huge demand and now people could afford it. Well, as they say, the rest is history. 1913, there were still no roads, but there was tremendous demand for highways. The Lincoln Highway was built. And of course today, roads as we know them. Things were quiet for me. I went to work for Pierce Arrow after that. And then I went to work and became a Dodge Brothers dealer in a small village named Springville, New York, just south of Buffalo. Things were quiet through World War II, and it wasn't until 1963 when I was asked by Reader's Digest to do, it, it, they had a series at that time called First Person Series, and I being the first person to win a race around the world was asked to do a story, which I did. Well, a chap who read that story was a man by the name of William F. Hara. Now, Bill Hara, some of you know as being an ardent automobile collector, most everybody knows Hara as being the casino owner making vast fortune in uh, casinos beginning out in Nevada and now spread throughout the United States. Well, Bill Terra was for automobiles, and at that time he had the largest personal automobile collection in the world, over 800 automobiles. It later grew to over 1,500 automobiles. So he set his people out to find the automobile if it still existed. They found what they thought was the Thomas Flyer in a museum out in Long Island. Brought the car to his uh, museum, which at that time was in an ice house in Sparks, Nevada, and he called me by phone and he said, Mr. Schuster, we think we have found the Thomas Flyer. And I said, well, that's quite impossible. The Thomas Flyer was actually scrapped during World War I. It's not there. And he said, well, we really would like to have you come. And so he encouraged me and so I agreed finally. I took my first aeroplane ride from Buffalo to the airport in Reno, Nevada, and there you'll see uh, Mr. Hara greeting me at the airport. I said, well, I'm quite interested to see what you can see, or to see what, what you have for me, but I already know that what the answer is going to be. The first time I stood in front of the car, I said, yes, that is a Model 35 1907 Thomas, but that's not the car that I drove to Paris. Many things had been changed on the car. The number of spokes on the wheel and modifications had been made to the, to the body. And he said, well, what I'd like to have you do, Mr. Schuster, is come back here tomorrow morning and we will take this car apart, piece by piece, and we'd like to have you here while I do that. I agreed to come back the next morning. When they took the upholstery, the leather upholstery off the seats, we had added seats. And in those days, the seats were of wooden frames. And then the upholsterer would come and put leather over it. But the carpenter who built the seat frame, I remember watching him carve the initials MB into the seat, into the wooden seat frame, which were, I later found out, the initials of his girlfriend, Minnie Byers. <laughs> well, when they took the upholstery off the flyer, I saw those initials. 
Of course, not knowing how many seat frames the carpenter had carved the initials into, I still wasn't convinced. When they lifted the body off the frame, I saw something that I took more seriously. There were actually two holes drilled in the frame, which was the result of a crack in Siberia. I drilled one hole to relieve the stress. I drilled another hole to apply an angle iron from a trans-Siberian locomotive to reinforce it. Well, the angle iron and the bolts were gone, but the holes were still there. I began to wonder, could it be? They got down to the clutch assembly, and when they pulled the cover off the assembly, outside of Moscow, the clutch had become so worn that it was freewheeling, and I had staked the shaft so that it wouldn't rotate freely, knowing that I would be able to make it to Paris and I would never have to take that, part of, that apart again. Well, when they took the clutch assembly apart, guess what? There was the repair that I had made in Moscow. I turned to Mr. Hara and I said, Mr. Hara, this is the Thomas Flyer that won the New York to Paris race. Now, Mr. Hara was quite a gambler and he had just won one of the biggest gambles he had ever made. He was thrilled. The decision then was, should it be restored as Bill Hara had restored all of his cars and all of his automobiles were to what he called five diamond condition. He would not show an automobile unless it was five diamond. And I said, Mr. Hara, the car, the fame of the car is how it finished the race, not how it started the race. So he directed his staff to restore the car to the exact same condition it was in when it finished the race in Paris. Now this was very difficult for the Harris staff to do because they just couldn't bring themselves to anything less than perfection. So they brought in a man by the name of Walt Disney. And Walt Disney's staff were charged with the task of making the flyer look the way the flyer should look. They even took from photographs, it was the custom when we would go through a village that the locals, we couldn't watch the car all the time, so the locals would carve their initials in the paint of the flyer. So when the restoration was done, after DuPont formulated paint exactly the same way they formulated it in 1908 to match perfectly the original paint job on, on the flyer, the Disney people then distressed the car back and then the artist took the photographs and carved into the paint the initials just as they were in 1908. The process took one year to complete. This is how the Thomas Flyer looked after that restoration, right down to the broken front left headlight. I got a call from Mr. Harris saying, Mr. Schuster, would you like to come back and see what we have done? I said, I'll be there. The car was in complete, had been completely restored and was in running operation. And he looked at me and said, Mr. Schuster, would you like to drive it? I said, certainly. I got behind that very familiar wheel and at the age of 93, I drove over some of the very same roads between the Sparks Ice House and Tonopah, Nevada that I had driven decades before. Well, the Thomas Flyer is today the centerpiece of the National Automobile Museum, and many of you have seen it, in Reno, Nevada, and uh, certainly has become a feature there. In 2008, there actually was an individual exhibit wing open for the Thomas Flyer, which was planned as a temporary exhibit, and the uh, museum has now said that will become a permanent exhibit. That was the biggest draw that the museum had ever had when the uh, Thomas Flyer had been featured during the centennial. This was the 45-star flag which flew from the Thomas Flyer. The premise was very simple. Six flags were issued to the cars that were at the starting line that morning. We were number six, and the winning car, the winning automobile, could turn this, the flag, the winning flag, in to the auto club for a one thousand dollar prize. I remember getting back to New York and I sent the flag back to the auto club. And a couple of weeks later I got a very kind letter back 
with the flag. I didn't get the $1,000 prize until 1967 <laughs> with no interest. But the best part is I got to keep the flag. So much has happened in the intervening years, but it smells like Thanksgiving dinner is ready for us. So kids, there will be time for more stories later. I think now we need to go in for supper. I can't thank you enough.